As you all know, tonight's lecture is What's in Your Genes? How Genetics is Changing the Cancer Equation. Are you all in the right forum? <laughs> Good. I'm McCona McClellan from the Corporate Communications Department here at Queens, and I am pleased to uh, welcome you to tonight's lecture. And now I am going to introduce each of them. And then after I introduce you, can you please stand? Okay. Allison Shaikowski. Allison is um, a certified genetic counselor at Queens. She joined the team here in May 2005. She is originally from Canada and moved to Honolulu in 2002. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in Cellular, Molecular, and Ri Microbial Bio Oh my gosh, that's so complicated! Microbial Biology from the University of Calgary. Allison received her Master of Science degree in Human Genetics, Genetic Counseling from the University of Pittsburgh. She is an American Board of Genetic Counseling Certified Genetic Counselor, and she provides clinical genetic counseling services to patients with a personal and or family history of cancer. She enjoys interaction with patients and professionals and is passionate about making a difference. Outside of work, Allison values her time with her two young daughters as well as fitness and the beach. Please welcome Allison. Please correct me if I'm saying the names incorrect, okay? Our next uh, panelist this evening is Christina Seelaus. Oh, no kidding. Certified genetic counselor at Queens. She joined the team in September 2014 after moving from Chicago where she worked as a genetic counselor in the cancer risk program at Stroger Hospital for six years. She received her Master of Science degree in genetic counseling from Northwestern University along with a Master of Arts degree in medical humanities and bioethics. She is certified by the American Board of Genetic Counseling. Prior to her genetic counseling training, Christina served a year with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps working at a free clinic in LA. She also did an internship with Genetic Alliance, an organization focused on advocacy and public policy. She values the opportunity to educate patients on the impact of genetics in clinical care in order to identify cancer at an early stage or prevent it altogether. Please welcome Christina. Bless you. Up next, we have Dr. Christopher Lum, Medical Director for Queen's Molecular Diagnostics Biorepository Laboratory. Whew. Dr. Lum received his degree in medicine from UH Jabsum, John A. Burns School of Medicine. He did his residency at USC, University of Southern California Department of Pathology. He did his fellowships in dermato, dermatopathology. How do you say it? Dermatopathology. Dermatopathology at Cornell University um, and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He is an assistant professor of pathology and an associate clinical professor of medicine, Division of Dermatology, at the John A. Burns School of Medicine. He is the director of the Hawaii Pathologist Laboratory Summer Research Program and a partner of Hawaii Pathologist Laboratory. He is an American Board of Pathology certified in anatomic and clinical pathology and dermatopathology. He is an American Board of Clinical Chemistry certified in molecular diagnostics. Woo! Please welcome Dr. Lum. <laughs> Kristen Kroom, she's the manager of the Pathology and Molecular Diagnostics Biorepository Laboratory at Queens, this campus, Punchbowl. She joined the team in 2006 as a DNA technologist. She is originally from a very small town in West Texas and moved to Hawaii to work in the DNA laboratory. She received her Bachelor of Science in Clinical Laboratory Science and her Master of Science in Molecular Pathology from Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. She, her passion is helping patients and their physicians by providing high quality laboratory results that can be utilized to make best decisions. Please welcome Kristen. I am so glad we got through this. I think we should applause everybody for getting through it. Thank you for sticking with me. 
And now, without further ado, I'm going to bring up Allison, and she will begin to present. Thank you all. Great. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming and joining us this evening. Um, can you guys hear me okay on the microphone? Okay, good, good. Um, so this here, this first slide here is just giving you an overview of what we'll be speaking about today. Um, I'll be covering the first part of it, which will be just a little bit of background on genetics and heredity, and then um, kind of starting into how we recognize hereditary cancer syndromes. And that's something that um, Christina and I as genetic counselors do every day. Um, and then we will then segue into um, Christina, who will be our second speaker, talking about the utility of germline genetic testing. And we'll explain more of what that is as well. And then Dr. Lum will come up and um, cover the next part, the trail of change. And then to close it up um, at the end, the technology behind genetic testing, Kristen Kroom will touch on that. And then, of course, um, like Makana just said, we'll be available for questions at the end as well. So many of you may remember um, seeing this story in the news, and this was back in May of 2013, which I can't believe is you know, four years ago already. So May 14th of 2013 in the New York Times, Angelina Jolie um, wrote an article, and it got a lot of media attention, both nationally and internationally as well. And she shared her story of how she um, has a family history of breast and ovarian cancer, um, didn't have a cancer diagnosis herself, but she found out that she carries a high-risk gene for breast and ovarian cancer. And so her initial article that came out again like about four years ago um, was telling her story of how she use that information to then have a double mastectomy, or in other words, to have both of her breasts surgically removed in order to prevent her from developing breast cancer. And she wrote a subsequent article of how she um, then had her ovaries removed as well because she was at high risk of ovarian cancer as well. If you haven't read those articles, they're short and I think well-written and worth um, even looking up. Um, but they, I think, importantly, um, I think helped to raise a lot of awareness um, amongst many people of certainly things with hereditary cancer and specifically what are called the BRCA genes. But I think also importantly, just on a broader level, helped a lot of people to start the conversation in their families of what family history of cancer they had. And I know certainly we saw directly a lot of patients who um, were in some ways inspired to come in by her story. And so I think that's always a good thing when um, celebrities can share a story about themselves that then can have positive impact like that because it's important for all of us to know what we can about our family history of cancer and other health conditions. So I'll be giving a little bit of um, just genetics background and overview to begin. Um, so what is a gene and um, you know what exactly does that mean? So you may have heard the terms before of genes or DNA, and really those terms can be used um, kind of to mean the same thing, basically. And basically our genes or our DNA are like instruction manuals for how our bodies grow and develop and function. And these are way, these are so tiny inside of us, they're nothing that we can see with just the naked eye, but these would be examples of, you know, a cartoon image of them, you know, significantly blown up um, or magnified. And so, um, when we think about genes, they are, again, our, you know, our inherited material that we inherit from our parents, and they are, like again, like instruction manuals for how our bodies grow, develop, and function. Often we'll call them like a blueprint or um, instruction manual or even like recipe for our bodies. Um, and technically, genes lead to proteins or genes code for proteins, um, which are just indicated there by that little red or orange um, figure there. And basically then it's the proteins that actually have jobs that they carry out in our bodies. So there's all kinds of um, functions that our proteins have and um, you know, that do a lot of different things in our bodies. Proteins are you know, what help make our eyes to see or 
you know, to help digest our food, many different things, but there definitely are proteins that play a big role in cancer and cancer prevention in our bodies too. Um, so most of the time, um, I'm not sure, yeah, sorry, I just tried to go back for a second. So most of the time in our bodies, um, things work very well. And genes code for proteins and they're normally functioning, they do a good job of doing the, the role or the job that they're supposed to do in our bodies. And I think our bodies are really amazing and so much of which we still don't understand about them, of course, and amazing at carrying things out quite well for the most part. But sometimes there are things that are called mutations. And basically a mutation, technically by definition, a mutation means a change within a gene. But really in the, in the clinical setting, when we say a mutation, um, what that means is that there's a change or an abnormality within a gene that causes the protein to then not function properly. So as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen there, a normal gene um, you know, leads to a healthy protein that then is gonna do a good job of carrying out its particular role in the body. And when we think of genes and proteins that are related to cancer, a lot of times what their function is, is to essentially in a way be preventing cancer or suppressing certain tumors from forming. So then when we have a situation of a mutation in a gene um, or an abnormally, an abnormality within a gene, that then leads to a protein not being normal and being damaged or not functioning. Sometimes mutations can lead to proteins just being absent, not being properly made, or, the, and, or them not being you know, fully formed. Um, or other times it can lead to the protein being there but just not functioning properly how it should. And so then as a result, like in the cancer setting, if we think of that, um, if the protein isn't able to do its job in preventing or suppressing certain tumors, then the, the risks of cancer then are elevated. Um, how do we get our genes or how, um, you know, how do they come to each individual, I guess? Um, so how, in other words, how are they inherited? So we get half of our genetic information from each of our parents. So genes, almost all genes come in pairs and one member of each pair comes from our mother and one member of each pair comes from our father. Um, and so typically we get half of our genetic information from each of our parents. Um, and, the, and then similarly, when we have children, we pass half of our genetic information down to our children. Um, and one of the significant things with that is um, by understanding that we get half of our genetic information from each parent, we know that each side of our family history is equally important. Um, so in other words, you know, it, so historically it used to be thought that for some things that maybe were more female related, like maybe female cancers, that knowing our mother's side of the family um, history was important, but our dad's side maybe didn't matter as much. But now we know because of things like this that both sides of our family history are equally important when it comes to most health information. Um, this is a slide to kind of show um, on a basic level, you know, essentially what, what cancer is and how that differs from normal cell division and then how that ties into genetics. So the top part of the slide we'll look at first. So kind of those like orangey colored cells up there. So throughout our lives and in our bodies, cells are dividing all the time. We have many, 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 many cell divisions throughout our lives. And I mean, that's how our bodies grow and develop, you know, from an early stage, but even throughout our lives, when we're fully grown, the cell divisions are happening all the time. And our bodies, like I was saying before, have <clears throat> really do a, a remarkable job of functioning very well and um, of doing that process of cell division pr pretty close to perfectly. Um, and where there even are mechanisms that if there ever is a mistake that happens when a cell is, is being divided or in a sense kind of being photocopied, um, there are incredible mechanisms in place to kind of correct that. Or even like it shows on that top part of the slide there to cause a cell to then die off. So a lot of times cell death is actually like in this type of context, a good thing um, when there's you know something abnormal that happens in a cell. Then if the body has a way of it dying off, then that then it doesn't lead to any harm. So our normal cell division again functions like that and functions quite well. 
In the bottom part of the slide, you can see more what happens when a cancer is developing. And, um, and essentially, you know, when a cancer starts to develop, it's, it always starts off with an initial mutation, an initial abnormality within a gene. In some cases, that mutation may be something that we were born with. We may have been born with a particular high-risk gene change. Um, or it can also sometimes just be a mutation that happens within a cell at some point in our lives. Um, but it starts out as a first mutation, and then you can see there that then a second mutation, like a second genetic abnormality develops, a third, a fourth, and so on and so forth, where eventually as a cancer is growing and developing, there are lots of genetic mutations or abnormalities that happen within those cancer cells. So again, those are not the same as genetic changes that we inherit, but within cancer cells themselves, there can be a lot of different genetic abnormalities or mutations that happen. And that's essentially, um, in a way, what cancer is, is cells that have lost their normal controlled cell growth. So they're, they're growing out of control, and so there's all these genetic mistakes, really, that start to happen. And you'll see later on in our presentation this evening how that information is becoming um, very important and impacting a lot of things with cancer treatment, understanding what those genetic changes are within the cancers. And then from the genetic counselor point of view, we often are focused on helping to figure out with someone born with a mutation that's putting them higher risk um, to begin with, and then what can we do about that? Um, I've mentioned some of this actually as I was going through that other slide, but this is kind of by definition the different um, types of mutations. So on the left-hand side of the screen are what we call somatic mutations, or those are, the other word you can think of instead of somatic or um, in addition to somatic is a, a mutation within a tumor. Um, so these are not inherited, they are not mutations that we're born with, and they can happen in virtually any cell in the body. And, and most cases of cancer, again, will have many different mutations or abnormalities that happen within them. So as that figure on the bottom left there shows that if there's a mutation in the tumor only, like a breast cancer or any other type of cancer, that's what we call a somatic or a tumor mutation. It's not something that that person was born with or that they inherited. Um, and again, in the later part of the talk, we'll be talking more about somatic mutations and how that's impacting cancer treatment. Um, germline mutations on the right-hand side, that's more, we can, the other word we can use for that is inherited mutations, or um, the word, a way I often explain it to patients who I'm working with are mutations in our core genetic material or the genes that we were born with. So they are heritable um, and pass through families. And, germline or mutations in our core genetic material are present in every single cell of our body. Um, and these particular mutations that we can be born with um, are thought to account for about 5 to 10% of cancer cases overall. So in other words, a mutation that you know comes from the egg or the sperm from a parent that's passed down to a child, that's what we call a germline mutation something that we're born with. It doesn't mean we're born with cancer, but it means we're born with a particular gene change, a mutation that makes us higher risk for particular cancers. Um, and this is just a slide to show, to represent the, the type of testing or the, the different testing for those two types of mutations. So the bottom part of the slide, I'll show you first the germline testing. So again, that's more what Chrissy and I do as genetic counselors is um, doing testing to look for germline mutations or gene changes within our core genetic material that we were born with. And usually we do this on blood, um, or some of them we can do on saliva. So that's a way that we can get a, um, a sample of our core genetic material. And then that type of information can help with some treatment decisions and also um, prevention of certain cancers and also um, better or more thorough screening to help with earlier detection. The top part of the slide, or tumor testing, is when we are looking for genetic changes or mutations within cancer cells themselves. And this is a lot of what um, Kristen and Dr. Lum do, where it's a lot of the genetic techniques are the same, but where the sample that it's being looked at 
um, is again the, are the cancer cells as opposed to our core genetic material. And that um, is becoming increasingly important in cancer treatment and things like chemotherapy decisions. Um, when we think of cancer overall, um, this is a picture to show you what proportion of cancer is hereditary or is caused by a gene mutation that we are born with. And that kind of dark blue part of it there where it shows that 5 to 10% again of cancer overall is hereditary. Or in other words, caused by a gene mutation that we were born with that put us higher risk. That kind of lighter blue or sort of turquoise-y um, picture or piece of the pie there that shows about 15 to 20 percent or maybe a little bit higher than that. Those are cases of cancer that can be familial or kind of running through a family but where it doesn't seem to have a single gene cause. Um, many of those cases probably do have genetic factors involved that we just don't understand yet or certain shared environmental factors. Um, and then the majority of cases of cancer are what we term sporadic or meaning that they don't have a, per a defined hereditary cause. Some of those may be more environmental in nature um, or just occur by chance or many of which we just don't know yet. But that's showing kind of the proportion of those different groups. And again, the hereditary that as genetic counselors we are trying to help identify is about 5 to 10 percent. So certainly that's a small proportion overall of cancer. Um, but for the families where, that, where a hereditary cancer syndrome, as we call it, is identified, that's very significant and important information. So I'll just touch on what the red flags are, the things that we look for in a family to make us more suspicious of something being hereditary. The first is if cancer is diagnosed at a younger age than kind of what, what is typical or, or more common of that particular cancer. So especially with cancers like breast, colon or rectal, and endometrial or uterine cancers, if those are ever diagnosed at or before age 50, that in itself is a red flag for a possible hereditary basis. It doesn't mean for sure that it is hereditary, but worthy of, of looking into it more and of a workup. Um, rare is another red flag that we look for. So cancer types that are not as common. So um, some examples are ovarian, pancreatic, or breast cancer in a male. Um, those are cancers that are less common overall. And if we see those at any age, um, that makes us concerned that there could be something hereditary. Um, again, doesn't mean that all of those cases are hereditary by any means, but they're a red flag. Multiple is our next red flag, and that means if we ever see more than one cancer within a person. Um, and that doesn't mean where we have a colon cancer that has spread to a different part of the body, but it means if there's been more than one separate individual cancer that has started out. Um, for example, if somebody has a colon and a uterine cancer or a breast and an ovarian cancer, or sometimes it might be two different colon cancers, things like that. And then lastly, of course, if we have a family history. So generally, if there's two or more family members with cancer, especially if they're the same type or types that can be related, and those are some examples of some ways in which they can be associated below. So those are the big red flags. And I'll just show you a last couple of slides here and then transition over to Chrissy for the next part of it. But just wanted to show you a couple of brief examples of family histories, or these are what we call pedigrees. So Chrissy and I and genetic counselors draw a family tree or a pedigree like this with every single patient who we see in our clinic. And basically circles show the females in the family, squares show the males, and the way the lines are connected allows us to see how everybody's related to each other. And it's incredibly helpful in our assessment because then we can see whichever particular thing we're paying attention to, which Chrissy and I are both cancer genetic counselors, we can look at the patterns of cancer in the family to then again help determine how suspicious or not suspicious it looks for something hereditary. So, um, and the arrow always points to the patient who we're meeting with. So in this case, it's a 31-year-old female that who are, we are meeting with. So this is an example if we were to see somebody who, um, whose mother was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 75 and then no other family history at least that's known. That would be something that we would say has a 
relatively low likelihood of being hereditary. So an older age, just a single case within a family, low likelihood of being hereditary, and most likely just a sporadic cancer. Um, familial, like I kind of mentioned before, is when things can be sort of running through a family, but where there's not necessarily a single gene hereditary cause. And so this would be an example if there's two close relatives with breast cancer. So for this patient, that's her mom's sister and her mom's mom, so a maternal aunt and a maternal grandmother with breast cancer at not terribly young ages. You know, when we think of things, again, relatively being that age 50 or young, younger is a red flag in itself. And this would be an example of something that is familial, where there probably is somewhat of an increased risk for other females, other family members, other close family members, but where it's likely not a single gene cause. And then the last example um, here, I've given you the answer up top <laughs> by the title of the slide, I realize, but um, this would be an example of a family that would look concerning to us of being a hereditary um, cancer syndrome. And that's because we see, so again, our patient is the 31-year-old female. In this family, she, her sister was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 30, so that's a red flag because young age. Um, her father was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and her father's sister with ovarian cancer. And those ones, again, if you remember on that previous slide, are more rare or less common cancers. So the ages of those diagnoses are not as significant, but just the fact that there are less common cancers and in close relatives. And then um, the other relatives are our patient's cousin on her dad's side and then her gr our patient's grandmother, her dad's mom, both also had breast cancer at young ages. So those are a number of red flags that we would be seeing in this family. And that would lead us to um, being fairly suspicious that there could be a hereditary cancer syndrome in them and that certainly would um, warrant discussion of genetic testing and so on. So I'll pass things over now to Chrissy who will get into the next part of our talk and talking a bit more specifically about hereditary cancer. And then, um, and then, like we said at the end, we'll all be up for questions. So thank you for your time. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Christina Silas, as mentioned earlier. I'm the other genetic counselor here at Queen's. I work with Allison. And I'm gonna be starting with this family we left off with. Um, so this family we know is suspicious for a hereditary cancer syndrome. So at this point, we would want to do some genetic testing to see if we could find a gene mutation that's causing the cancers in the family. So then the question is, who should undergo genetic testing? It's not always the patient that's in front of us who's the best person in the family to do the test first. Um, and there's actually some guidelines here from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network um, for some cancers that help guide who is appropriate for genetic testing. And it might be a little bit hard to see, there's a lot of indications on here, but some of those red flags, like young age, so any woman diagnosed with breast cancer at age 45 or younger would meet these criteria for testing regardless of her family history. Um, other criteria are being diagnosed with breast cancer age 50 or younger, maybe with one more relative that's had a related cancer, such as breast or ovarian, prostate, pancreatic cancer, or sometimes if there's just three relatives in the family that have had these cancers at any age. And then otherwise those rarer cancers, like men with breast cancer, um, diagnosed at any age, genetic testing would be appropriate, or any woman with ovarian cancer. So one thing I'll point out here is that an unaffected individual, so a person who has not had cancer, is actually not the best person to test first. Um, and that's because we don't know for sure what's actually going on in our example family. Maybe there's a genetic mutation there, but if we test our unaffected patient who hasn't had cancer and she's negative, we don't know if she's negative because there is something in the family and she didn't get it, or is she negative because something else caused the cancer in the family? 
maybe some other gene we don't know about and can't test for, or some other environmental reason. So if she's negative, it doesn't really help us. We don't know what that means for her. So if we start with somebody that's had cancer and we find the explanation, then we can test the other relatives in the family to see if they have it too, and then that becomes informative for them. Um, as far as genetic testing, um, this is just an example slide that shows that there are many genes out there that can cause breast cancer. It's not just BRCA1 and 2, which a lot of people have heard of now. Um, and nowadays we can do genetic testing with what we call a panel test, meaning one tube of blood, we can check multiple genes at the same time for those changes or mutations within any of these genes. Um, this is relatively new, because even just four or five years ago, we might only test for BRCA1 and 2, because we weren't as aware of some of these other genes, and it was often very expensive, um, very difficult to do the testing, whereas that's improved a lot now, and we can get a lot of information all at once. And I'll just point out, too, that different genes have different levels of risk for cancer. So some genes might be associated with certain types of cancers, other genes other types, and some might have very high risk for cancer, and some might have just a little bit increased risk for cancer. So it does get a little bit more complicated with the genetic testing nowadays. Um, and with the example we have here, I'm mostly going to focus on the BRCA1 and 2 genes for now. So coming back to our family, we've got this 31-year-old woman who hasn't had cancer. So who do we want to test? We really want to test those relatives that had the breast cancer at a young age, so her sister and her cousin. So in this example, the cousin does a genetic test, and we find a mutation. She's positive for a change or mutation in the BRCA2 gene, um, which would make sense, because that's when we tend to see the young breast cancers, the pancreatic, the ovarian, kind of explains the pattern of cancer in the family. And we could guess that some of these other relatives with cancer have that same mutation, that it's coming down through the family. So then if the patient's sister tests, as expected, she has that same BRCA2 mutation. So now we pretty much know that all these relatives have that mutation that's coming from the paternal grandmother. So the patient's father's mother who had breast cancer at a young age has that mutation and it got passed down to the patient's father. And that means that our patient has a 50% chance she has that mutation and a 50% chance that she doesn't. So just like flipping a coin. And we test her and good news for her, she's negative. Now that's an informative result because we know what's causing the cancer in the family and we know she didn't get it. So that is great news for her. She's at average risk for cancer. We can't say for sure she won't get one of these cancers, but now we know she's not at higher risk than the general population. So she can do the normal screening guidelines. So in that case, that's an informative result. But if we had tested her first and she's negative and we don't have anything to compare to, that wouldn't have been as helpful for us. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about those BRCA1 and 2 genes. Um, so for individuals that do have a mutation in one of those genes, it causes um, a syndrome, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. And a lot of times people do ask, you know, what's the difference between 1 and 2? We often talk about them together. Um, they are two different genes, but they act in the same way. So that's why we kind of lump them together when we talk about them. But usually somebody, if they have a mutation, it's just in one gene or the other. These are called tumor suppressor genes. So their job in the body is to help prevent tumors. So they're actually very important genes. And you might hear people say, oh, so-and-so has BRCA1 or has BRCA, BRCA2. And we all actually have these genes. It's just when we have a change in them that we're concerned, because that means higher risk for cancer. Um, we know that if these genes are normally protecting us from cancer, having that mutation means higher chance for cancer, because the gene can't work. And the highest risks are for the breast and ovarian cancer, which is how they got the name for the syndrome, but we do know that there are other cancers that we can see with these genes too. 
And this is just another little example of how it shows um, the DNA there on the left. And if it's no, um, no mutations, no changes working normally, it makes a protein that does the job in the body. But if there is that genetic change, as Allison explained earlier, that means the protein either can't be made or is made incorrectly and therefore can't help protect from cancer. And that's what leads to that higher risk or higher chance for cancer to happen. Doesn't mean for sure cancer would happen, but just the chance is higher. So Allison explained earlier to this concept of autosomal dominant inheritance, meaning that if there is a genetic mutation in the family, other people can have it too, but it doesn't mean that everybody will. Um, so if there is an individual with a genetic mutation, there's a 50% chance that their first degree relatives, like their children, would inherit it, but the 50% chance they won't. And these genes actually don't skip generations. A lot of people ask about that too. Sometimes they might look like they're skipping because maybe you see somebody with cancer like a grandmother and then the father doesn't have cancer, but then um, the patient, the granddaughter does. But the father in between actually does have the genetic mutation, but just never developed the cancer. Might be at higher risk, just didn't get it. So it looks like it's skipping, but the gene itself is still being passed down. Um, and also, as was said earlier, um, can be passed down by both men and women. So even though these genes are related to breast and ovarian cancer, men can have them too, and we always need to look to the father's side in addition to the mother's side. Um, so as far as some of the cancer risks with the BRCA1 and 2 genes, these are what we consider high-risk genes. So the risk for breast cancer might be up to as high as about 87% in a woman's life. There's quite a range of risk and what the studies have shown, and most people probably have about 60 to 70% risk, but some of the studies have said it could be up to as high as 87%. Um, if a woman gets breast cancer, there's also a higher than normal chance she'll get a second breast cancer, a whole new one, maybe in the other breast, or perhaps still within the same breast, um, not the same as a cancer that came back, not a recurrence, but a whole new cancer that starts. There's also a higher chance of ovarian cancer, maybe up to as high as about 44%. Men with breast cancer, higher risk up to about 8%. Not as high as women, but that's pretty high for men. Um, higher chance for prostate cancer for men. Um, and pancreatic cancer for men and women up to about maybe 8%. So what do we do for these individuals? Some people ask like, oh great, you're going to tell me I'm high risk for cancer and you know, send me on my way and I'm just going to worry about it. Well, the reason we do genetic testing is so we can do something about it. So we can find cancer early or prevent it. So one of those options is increased surveillance or doing more screening. So there's a little cartoon there on the side. So if um, any women that's had a mammogram might be able to relate to that. Um, but otherwise, the things that are recommended are breast awareness. So know what's normal for a woman and then anytime it feels abnormal, looks different, see the doctor right away. Clinical breast exams, so when the doctor does the physical exam, checking for any lumps um, about every six to 12 months, starting at 25. Um, then we start breast MRIs, which most women wouldn't get, not the average risk woman, but women in a higher risk group, it is recommended starting young at 25. And then at age 30, adding in mammograms every year. So a woman would get a breast MRI and a mammogram every year. Um, and then usually after about age 75, it's a conversation with the doctor of what screening should be considered or continued, and it's kind of more personalized. So the other option for women is what we call the risk-reducing mastectomy, and that means surgery to remove the breasts to lower the chance of breast cancer, to get that risk as close to zero as you can get. Because some women say, gosh, if I have such a high chance for breast cancer, I don't want to sit and wait for it to happen and go through screening every year. Just remove my breast so I don't have to worry about it. And then there are women that say, well, geez, if there's nothing wrong with them right now, surgery sounds so drastic, and they prefer to do the screening. And either way is fine. These are both options. Um, but one thing that is recommended is the surgery for the ovaries, 
So once a woman's done having children's surgery to take out the ovaries and the fallopian tubes to prevent that cancer from happening, because that can be a really tricky cancer, a little bit hard to find early, so we do recommend surgery to prevent ovarian cancer. Sometimes medications are an option as well. A medicine called tamoxifen, some women might take if they have breast cancer as part of their treatment, but some women take the medicine for a couple years that lowers their chance of getting breast cancer in the first place, um, might cut the risk in half. And then taking the birth control pill can actually lower the chance of ovarian cancer. So sometimes these medicines can be helpful in lowering risk. For men that have BRCA mutations, um, the breast self-exam training is important for them too. Um, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, men don't have breasts, but they actually do have some breast tissue, just not as much as women. So just knowing what's normal for them, you know, if there is a lump, see the doctor right away, and then having the doctor do that physical clinical exam about every year, starting at age 35. Um, and then the prostate cancer screening is recommended for men with BRCA2 mutations. Um, and the guidelines say it can be considered for men with BRCA1 mutations. We think the risk is a little bit higher with BRCA2. So back to some of our famous examples. Um, so a lot of people have heard or read about Angelina Jolie, um, and she was very public, you know, with her choice in doing genetic testing and the surgeries that she opted to do. And then there are several other women, Christina Applegate, Cheryl Crow, Melissa Etheridge. They've all done genetic testing as well and kind of told a little bit about their story. So a lot of people are hearing about it now um, on the news or in different ways because um, they are being more vocal about it and it's helping to spread awareness, which is great. So the reason we do genetic testing and identify these hereditary cancer syndromes is, first of all, if cancer happens, we want to find it as early as possible. We want to catch it right away when it's best treated, or if we can prevent it from happening altogether, um, that would be great. And then if we can provide information for family members. So sometimes some people say, well, I'm not sure if I'd want to know or want to do anything different for myself, but if it could really help my children, I want to do a genetic test for that reason. So this historically have been the benefits of doing genetic testing, but now what we know about, um, genetic testing can now help with the treatment of cancer in some situations. And this is really exciting. This is really new to us um, and has another benefit for doing genetic testing. And one example is a drug called Limparza. So back in December 2014, the FDA approved this drug for the treatment of ovarian cancer for certain patients. Um, now you might be wondering, how does that work? You know, how do we all of a sudden have this drug and how does that tie into people with genetic mutations? So Limparza is a drug that's called a PARP inhibitor. A PARP inhibitor um, the PARP stands for the poly-ADP ribose polymerase. It's kind of a mouthful. But just know that it is a group of proteins um, that works in different cellular processes. But one of those is DNA repair. And that's very important. So if you're inhibiting PARP, then you're preventing one of those mechanisms for DNA repair. Now I'll tell you why this is important. So this is another little example here. Let's say in this example on the left, you have a normal cell. And we know that DNA damage, these genetic mutations, we've heard now they can happen over time in anybody in any cell. But normally we have these mechanisms to repair themselves. So let's say there's a normal cell, there's some DNA damage, PARP can come in and repair it, the cell lives on, everything's fine. So now let's take a cell and add in a PARP inhibitor. So now you have a normal cell. It has a genetic mutation. If you're inhibiting PARP from fixing that mutation, no problem. We've got other mechanisms, one of those being the BRCA genes. They swoop in. They do the job. Great. The DNA is repaired. The cell lives on. So now let's take the example of a cancer cell, so one that already has genetic mutations in it. So then if you add in the PARP inhibitor, the PARP's not there to do the job to fix the DNA damage. 
But if there's also mutant BRCA, if there's a BRCA mutation somebody has that they've inherited or is in the cancer, and that can't do the job to repair the DNA, it means the cell dies off. And if we're killing cancer cells, that's great news because that means we're treating the cancer. So now we know that these drugs called the PARP inhibitors are especially effective for people that have cancers due to the BRCA mutations. And a lot of the studies have been done with the ovarian cancer. Um, and that's why these drugs have now been approved for treatment of some patients with ovarian cancer that have these BRCA mutations. Um, so initially when these drugs were approved, um, it was for people that have these germline BRCA mutations. So again, germline meaning the genetics you inherit. So we do the blood test to see if they have that BRCA mutation that they got from a parent. And if that's what was causing the ovarian cancer, then you could use the PARP inhibitor. But more recently, some drugs have been approved for people that have BRCA mutations in the tumor, in their cancer, but they don't have them in the germline. They weren't born with them. It just happened to be a change that happened in the cancer. But we think the drug is also effective for them too. So now we wonder, well, if we can treat BRCA associated ovarian cancers with a PARP inhibitor, what about BRCA caused breast cancers or prostate or pancreatic? Wouldn't it work in the same way? So that's where we have some clinical trials right now because the thought is that it can be effective for those cancers and we just need the studies and the trials to kind of show and see if that works. Um, then the other thing we think about is, well, there's other genes that work in that same DNA repair pathway. It's not just the PARP and the BRCA. There's other genes out there too. So if they're not working as well, could the PARP inhibitors actually work for those cancers too? So that's where there's a lot of promise right now and a lot of studies um, of how we can better target the treatment of these cancers um, based on either the genetics we're born with or the genetics within a tumor. So even now, some labs are offering pair testing where you can send in a sample of tumor, you can send in a sample of blood, and they'll do the germline testing, so the genetics we inherit, along with the somatic testing, the genes in the tumor, and then give all that information all at once. That can help with treatment decisions, knowing risk for future cancer, information that could be helpful for the family. So it's actually a very exciting time in cancer genetics. So at this point, we're gonna transition um, into the somatic testing. We're gonna have our pathology colleagues talk a little bit about the testing of the cancers and how that assists with the cancer treatment nowadays. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk to you about uh, the way that genes are being used to dictate therapy. Uh, Allison and Christina have given us a background on how genes are used in uh, patients for hereditary and germline genetic variants. Uh, toward the end of the discussion, they also highlighted therapy that is used to treat hereditary genetic alterations. But now I wanted to talk to you about how to, on focusing on how to, to uh, a way of thinking about different therapeutic strategies in cancer based on those genetic alterations in the somatic tumor. Uh, these developments are taking place on the somatic side or the changes that are occurring within the tumor that you're not born with. Uh, but as Christina and Allison have shown us that the implications of this new therapy may be uh, helpful for both somatic and inherited mutations. So I am a surgical pathologist, and what that means is that I spend most of my day looking down the tube of a microscope here. And what I do there is that I diagnose cancer based on morphology, which is the way that the tumor looks. And based on that morphology, I determine a very significant decision point for patients, which is, is this tumor benign or is it malignant? Is it something that will hurt the patient, malignant, 
or is it something that will not benign? And after having made that determination, the rest of what I do is look for other morphologic features which can predict that tumor's behavior. Things like invasive growth pattern, growth rate, the size of the tumor, the invasion of vessels and nerves. And all that is done is to do is to predict and determine how aggressive this tumor will be for that patient. And this will ultimately have a hand in determining how aggressive a treatment should be. Is it something that is so aggressive and extensive that there is no reasonable chance for cure? Or is it something where there is a better than average chance of cure and that we can really clear this cancer and cure this patient? Up until 2011, and arguably up until the early 2000s, the prediction of a tumor's behavior was predominantly done by morphology or the way it looked. But then in 2003, something very exciting happened, and that was the end or the completion of the Human Genome Project. And the repercussions of that significant achievement have provided us accessible technologic tools to open the human genome to cancer care. I'm just going to name off some of these technologies so that you can be aware of them so that in case you come across them, you would know that this, this is how it was associated. So PCR, or the polymerase chain reaction, FISH, or fluorescent in situ hybridization, microarray hybridization, and next generation, next generation sequencing are all toolkits that are used in today's genetic technology. And this is something that Kristen Kroon will be talking about after me. They represent a disruptive innovation, meaning that they change the way in which we understand cancer. And by understanding them, we, it creates new thinking in the ways that we can treat cancer. Um, some other examples of disruptive innovations. Can anybody think of some other disruptive innovations that have affected our lives? The personal computer, cell phones, and arguably fire. Um, I was fortunate that during my uh, pathology training, uh, this transition happened. And uh, in 1970, acute myeloid leukemia was diagnosed and prognosed based on morphology. And so what you see here are stages or um, different classifications of myeloid leukemia, and they're all based on uh, the way that the cells looked. Were they early cells? Were they semi-early cells? Were the cells, did they have foamy cytoplasm? Were they round? And these were all subjective assessments of that morphology and that prognosis. Then in 2002, something very exciting happened, and that the World Health Organization came out and with a new classification where acute myeloid leukemia was now diagnosed based on genetic changes. And all of the numbers that you see here, and all the letters here, are all genetic changes that they're identifying within those cancers. And it was this um, genetic changes that were able to predict whether a tumor was going to be very aggressive or whether it wasn't going to be very aggressive. And this was a very significant change in the way that, that we were thinking that this was more, mainly morphology, and these were changes that were mainly genetic. Interestingly, what happened is that all of these morphologic changes that were present for these acute myeloid leukemias that had some uh, clinical prognostic significance were all relegated to this latter category called AML not otherwise specified. These were all genetic alterations that were in the textbooks, but people didn't use them. They were just kind of just, um, just interesting facts that no one really used in a very clinical way. But now, with this new classification with the WHO, genetics equaled prognosis. Then in 2013, the Cancer Genome Atlas group from the NCI and NHGRI at, uh, in, uh, um, at, the, at the National Cancer Institute published their work in Nature describing the breast cancer sub molecular subtypes. And while seemingly one disease, breast cancer, they in fact represented four different diseases. 
with different prognostic and different therapeutic categories. This began subtyping of cancers that were not based on morphology, but actually on genetics. And this took place within malignant melanoma, endometrial cancer, and lung cancer. This is a glimpse at some of their work where they did microRNA expression analysis um, of common genes that are associated with the breast cancer. And what came out of that microarray expression analysis was four different patterns. And in those patterns came out different therapeutic and prognostic categories. The four different types of breast cancers that fell out of this analysis were luminal A, luminal B, HER2 positive breast cancer, and triple negative or basal subtype. And interestingly, luminal A actually did better in terms of prognosis, whereas triple negative breast cancers did poorly. Triple negative breast cancers um, didn't respond as well to hormone therapy or anti-HER2 therapy, and were probably best treated to begin with with chemotherapy whereas luminal A breast cancers that had a better prognosis did well with hormone therapy and anti-HER2 therapy and probably didn't need to be treated with chemotherapy and all of its side effects. This also took place for melanoma, which was very interesting. Melanoma was once seen as one disease, but when we were able to sequence the genetics of the melanoma cells, it turned out that they too had different genetic subtypes. And in that, there were um, the superficial spreading subtype, the lentigral malignant subtype, and the acral and mucosal lentiginous subtypes. And interesting also for melanoma was the fact that they also kind of predicted a sort of a lifestyle treatment susceptibility in that melanomas that occurred on the non-chronically -chronic sun-exposed skin, like the chest and back, had a higher mutation of a gene called BRAF, B-R-A-F. And melanomas that occurred on chronically sun-exposed skin, like lentigo maligna, and on the face, actually had a higher KIT or KIT mutation rate. And what was more interesting from this fallout was the fact that not only could we predict the subtype of melanoma based on their genetic mutations. Not only could we predict melanomas based on the susceptibility to UV exposure, but all of these genetic alterations had a therapeutic counterpart, meaning that you could treat BRAF, mutate, mutated melanoma, with a particular drug, and that you could treat KIT mutated melanomas with a particular drug. And that was very exciting. And that began the next evolution of this type of thinking about genetics and therapeutic decision making in that genes at, at the early days was, were seen as genes could predict prognosis. Now what we were seeing was something very exciting that now genes could predict therapy. And this began the, the paradigm that we are in now where we are looking at molecular targeted therapies where each cancer has a possibility of a particular mutation and that mutation has a drug that can be treated. Over time it was discovered that a number of tumors had characteristic gene mutations. So this is a list of a couple of cancer types that we looked at. And these are a list of genetic targets that are known to occur in some of these cancers. And these genetic targets had an associated therapeutic target, and these are the names of these therapeutic targets. And what was even more interesting when we looked at them is that even though they are from different organ systems, and even though they represented different morphologies, they had a particular target that when treated with their counterpart drug, responded well. And you can see here, two seemingly different cancers, lung and melanoma, both had BRAF mutations that both could respond to verimafinib, as well as melanoma and gastric sarcoma. Both have a KIT or KIT mutation, and both could respond to uh, anti-KIT 
inhibitor or imatinib. This was also seen for lung and sarcoma, seemingly two separate tumors, yet still responding to a particular drug. So like any disruptive innovation, genetic technology allowed us to have a new perspective into the way we treat cancer. In the past, the organ type or the site of disease dictated the therapy. But in this situation, tumors of three different sites had the same mutation and responded to the same therapy. Could genetic mutations that dictate cancer therapy be morphologically agnostic? meaning that morphology didn't matter, that the genetic alterations alone could predict that therapy. This set the scene for the current paradigm that we exist in right now, where patients that have failed standard chemotherapy, that have no known molecular target for molecular targeted therapy, usually are, have a, one last effort in order to look for a molecular target by doing comprehensive DNA sequencing. And what that means is they are, like uh, Christina had talked about, is that we use a technology where we can look at a number of genes, sometimes 50, sometimes 200, sometimes 400 genes, and it's molecular fusion products, looking for a target to see if there is a molecular targeted counterpart that could treat that mutation. If there is one that is found that shows promise in terms of NCCN or known national guidelines for that particular therapy, then they, patients can get that therapy if it exists. If it doesn't exist, then we look for clinical trial options that may be available so that a patient can get that drug because it doesn't fit within our known guidelines of, of, of treatment. This is a very promising and very interesting and exciting time for that kind of thinking, that maybe because a tumor doesn't look a certain way, but if we could find some molecular alteration that can be treated, we can possibly reduce that tumor and possibly increase that patient's survival. A number of trials have begun to look at this type of thinking, and these are called basket trials, and this is a new evolving form of clinical trial. In the past, clinical trials were designed very specifically. One therapy, one stage, one cancer. And it was a very controlled environment in which we had to look at that. In this situation, we're looking at the presence of a molecular marker that can predict a treatment response independent of what it looks like under the microscope. The known uh, basket trials that are in its latter stages of recruitment that we are anxiously in, in anticipation to find out whether this actually works, whether morphology can be um, where, where their uh, genetic testing can be morphologically agnostic, or is the IMPACT 1 and 2 trial, or the Integrated Molecular Profiling in Advanced Cancers trial. The NCI Molecular Analysis for Therapy Match Choice, or the NCI Match, and the Star Trek trials looking at entrectinib and some of their other alterations that occur in not just lung cancer, but in sarcomas. In 2002, Weinstein began some of this thinking in that he called tumors having oncogene addiction, meaning that there was one gene that was usually the driver mutation that converted it to cancer. And this was the idea of a single driver mutation. But as we dealt with tumor biology and looking at genes, over time, we realized that tumor biology is much more complex than a single driver mutation, and that there are usually multiple things that are going on in terms of causing a cell to change into cancer. And it reminds me of Dr. Ian Malcolm, if you can remember this picture here from the movie Jurassic Park, where he was counseling the scientists when they were trying to control dinosaurs that sometimes life just finds a way. And if you think about it, tumors in some ways are a particular separate life form. And in a way, while we are treating them by trying to block their proliferative pathway so that we can kill them, they eventually find a way in order to survive, a certain Darwinian factor that allows them to escape that. And we've seen that in some molecular targeted therapies where they have a certain window of efficacy and then begin to plateau and the tumor regains its growth rate. We've seen this in colon cancer, 
We've seen this in melanoma, and we've seen this in lung cancer, all having some points where additional alterations allow it to escape the molecular, molecular targeted therapies that we impose upon it. So one targeted monotherapy for molecular targeted therapies and precision medicine is unlikely to really be sufficient in terms of killing cancer. It will probably have to be a combination type of uh, targeted approach. And this in, comes into the play of when we have multiple genetic targets that we have for comprehensive profiling of tumors, we'll probably have to do pathway analyses. And this is one such pathway analysis looking at melanoma where we are looking at the RAS-RAF pathway We're looking at the RAS-RAF pathway, where not only will we have to be treating with uh, BRAF, the anti-BRAF inhibitor of verimafenib, but we'll have to be also treating for downstream effector um, proteins, MEK and ERK. And these are the, the genetic uh, um, targeted therapies that are associated with those types of mutations. So when we look at this type of pathway analysis, Physicians won't have to look at single lists of drugs, I mean, single lists of mutations anymore. We'll have to look at them in a way that they're all interconnected, where we have these kind of ball and stick models where we'll have to be able to rotate them in a way that we can identify the pathway that's affected and then begin to treat the pathway and not just the single gene. A lot of those um, bioinformatic systems exist to do that analysis, and a lot of them are on um, portable um, devices such as your smartphone. So in this short time, what I tried to do is talk to you about, about my observations in the evolution of the way that genes and somatic mutations are used to treat cancer. So I've showed you that prognosis was in the past simply dictated by morphology and organ site. And that hopefully what I've shown you over this short course is that genetics were important in prognosis. But really, and excitingly, genetics are important in treatment decisions. And this treatment decision using genetic targets is a um, workflow called molecular targeted therapy or precision medicine. And the exciting future of this type of technology and this type of therapy is, does morphology matter? Can we treat on genetics alone? Comprehensive genomic profiling of therapeutic targets is a way in which we can provide hope for for patients that have failed standard chemotherapy and guideline um, uh, indicated molecular targeted therapy. But really, the evidence for that type of, an of analysis and treatments really rests in the, the results of the basket trials that are ongoing and current. But in the future, monotherapy, molecular targeted therapies is probably um, will be not sufficient in terms of being able to really provide patient survival. It will probably be a combination of molecular targeted therapies based on pathway analysis. Thank you. Hi. My name is Kristen. I'm the manager of the pathology lab in the genetics lab here at Queens. And I wanted to take this time to talk about the amazing work that we're doing in, at Queens to help diagnose some of these cancers for our patients. We've gotten really lucky, and the technology has gotten really good at being able to find very small amounts of tumor and very small amounts of mutations within, any, within the tumor. Excuse me. One of the best ways that we're able to get testing, we're able to get tumors is through a fine needle aspirate which is not a, this is usually done on an outpatient basis in the imaging department. So the doctor essentially takes a needle and using imaging is able to collect tumor in that needle. They put it on a slide and that comes down to the pathology department where we are able to extract DNA from that tissue. Dr. Lum talked about all the amazing things that we're doing now. This is kind of an older version of sequencing, which started with PCR. And even though 
it really got popular in the early 2000s. We were doing sequencing starting back to the 1970s on radioactive gels. Essentially, as was mentioned before, we have four D, um, DNTPs, G's, A's, T's, and C's. We were able to amplify that specific area of uh, specific area of the gene that we were looking for and we were able to sequence it. So even though we weren't really sure what we were looking for in that gene, we could sequence the entire gene to look at it. This took a very long time and it was very technically complicated to be able to do. That's why it took so long and that's why it was always really expensive. And in the early 2000s, we were only able to really do one gene at a time. Fast forward to late 2000s, we got next generation sequencing. And that's kind of what, that's what helped the Human Genome Project finish. The way this worked is instead of just sequencing one, one little gene at a time, we could sequence multiple genes at a time because our technology got better and cheaper. So that way we could offer this to everybody else. So at this rate in our genetics lab right now, we do have a 50 gene panel that we're able to sequence all 50 genes and analyze it in about a week. And that's really helpful, and it's great that Queens has been able to support us to be able to do this here and not have to wait the two to three days to send it to the mainland. One of the other companion diagnostics to next generation sequencing is fluorescence in, fluorescence in situ hybridization. What this does is this is fluorescently labeled probes that look at big pieces of genes. For example, in BRCA1, it's a gene that's turned off or turned on, and another mutation is called HER2. And what we're looking at here is multiple copies of the gene. So for some reason, there's mutations in it that are causing a lot of the HER2 protein to be produced, and that's what causes uh, breast cancer. So as you can see in this picture, we have a whole lot of different red dots, which are just probes to all the different HER2 genes in those cells. And that's all I really had. <laughs> so I'll call Makana back to run questions. Thank you all very much. Well, sorry. So what we'll do for Q&A is just um, we probably have about 10 minutes or so if you can just raise your hand. We're going to give you the mic because we just want to make sure everybody can hear the question. I'm going to take this side first, and then there's a question here for after. Hi, I have a question for Christina. Is there a um, thyroid cancer? Is there a some type of relative? Is it somewhat relative in terms of looking at thyroid as well as breast cancer? Um, so I guess the question was, is there some type of maybe connection between breast and thyroid cancer? Um, so there's certain cancers that we think about that are more likely inherited than others. Um, and like most cancer, thyroid usually occurs sporadically, usually not genetic, but there are some syndromes where we can see thyroid cancer. Um, and there is a syndrome where we sometimes see breast and thyroid cancer together. And sometimes that's with uterine um, or colon or kidney, other cancers too. And sometimes we're looking at the type of thyroid cancer because there can be different types. And that helps in our risk assessment too. So sometimes it can be connected to breast cancer. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question about uh, a, a clinical situations where um, you do molecular analysis uh, in the primary tumor. Uh, you come up with a certain profile and you treat the patient. And let us say after a while uh, the tumor recurs or metastasizes, and you go after it again. Do you then redo the molecular diagnosis and compare it to the initial primary tumor? And how often do you see new mutations uh, in, the, in the new setting? And 
this is also this is also with with or without uh, initial targeted treatment. Okay, let's say you 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 decide to use targeted therapy and the patient responds for a period of time and develop resistance, then you go after it again. Do you often see a change in the molecular profile? And putting it in more of a clinical and economic uh, reality, this is getting very expensive and you know, does Medicare pay for it? And you know, that, can you make some comment on that? That is a uh, multi-part question, and let me, uh, let me start by answering your first part of the question, which is primary tumor and metastasis, and then I'll approach it from a therapeutic standpoint, and sorry, from a theoretical standpoint, and then from a practical standpoint. So the theoretical standpoint is that the primary tumor and the metastasis possibly is seen as two different tumors. And if you think about it, the tumor has to have an ability to grow at a, have a significant rate, to have some sort of growth advantage to the other cells. And by doing that, it has a gain in proliferative activity. And by that primary uh, change, it, it becomes a tumor. But then to metastasize, it needs to acquire different characteristics to escape the boundaries of the organ system from which it knows how to grow in. It has to be able to access the bloodstream. And then once it even accesses the bloodstream and it lands, like say, let's say, in the brain or the lung or the skin, it has to grow in an entirely different environment that it's not used to. So it will probably have to have changed in its genetic makeup to allow it for it to grow in that setting. That's sort of like the, the, the new thinking behind some of the differences between primary tumor and metastasis. It likely has different genetic profile. Practically, we do see that in, in uh, lung cancer, where the initial profile of the lung cancer in its primary setting um, has a particular profile, and that in the metastatic setting, sometimes it acquires a different mutation that allows it to escape EGFR therapy or anti-EGFR therapy, and that by testing for it again, in that metastatic setting, we can identify that other mutation that allowed it to escape primary treatment. Um, thankfully, the drug companies have followed up and have been able to not only have a drug that can treat the primary EGFR mutation, but it has a drug that can treat the, the resistance mutation as well. So it is important to test the primary tumor and in the metastatic setting or the setting where there is recurrence to treat that recurrence or to test that recurrence. The uh, question about expensive, uh, the expense and whether it is covered. Well, um, this is an evolving technology. It is also a technology where the costs are coming down. And um, as the um, the kits get cheaper and less, more or less, uh, less expensive, the, the costs to the patients become less. Um, as the, the data grows uh, and the successes of molecular targeted therapy are better presented to the insurance payers, the more likely they are to reimburse these. Um, a lot of these different molecular targeted therapies um, are considered tier one or very well accepted high proof evidence that are reimbursed by Medicare. Others in larger panels are not done so, but you probably um, handle those on a case by case basis. But the, the point is that um, they are seen as a significantly affecting patient care and that a number of them are being reimbursed by payers. Thank you so much for uh, sharing this very interesting information. Uh, going with the example that uh, uh, Christina had for the asymptomatic uh, individual uh, with, uh, uh, and even one with no uh, relative familial history, um, uh, using a BRCA1-2 test and coming back with a negative example, I, I understand how that would be uh, pointless or no, not useful. However, if that individual were to come back with a positive test, would that not be helpful to uh, help that individual to 
be able to uh, target their their future treatment and, and uh, diagnosis. Uh, and and also, uh, second part is uh, what about an individual that uh, has had uh, like a squamous cell carcinoma, a melanoma, something like that? Would that be included in that example of an asymptomatic individual, or would that be someone that that has a history that, that would uh, pertain? Thank you. Um, that's a really good question, and actually, there are scenarios where we do test the unaffected individual first for the reason you said, that sometimes it does come back positive, and that is helpful information. Um, usually, when a patient is with us, if they haven't had cancer, we kind of explore if the relatives that have had cancer might be willing to do a genetic test first. Um, but sometimes somebody says, I know my sister, she will never do this, she's not interested, or all the relatives that have had cancer have passed away, or people are estranged from those relatives. So we certainly do do testing for patients who haven't had cancer, um, but if possible, we try to test the one with cancer first. Um, and then the second part of your question where you mentioned, um, I think more defining like affected or unaffected, so like would somebody with like melanoma qualify? So when we look at a family, we want to test the one who's most likely to have the genetic mutation. So if you're looking at a family with a lot of breast cancer and there's also a lung cancer and a smoker, that person, even though they've had cancer, still wouldn't be the best person to test because we don't necessarily think the lung cancer is related to the breast cancers. Um, or even if somebody had breast cancer at 85 in a family, if there's another relative that had it at 35, we'd rather test that person first, just in case the 85-year-old got breast cancer by chance and there still was a mutation in the family. So we try to test the most informative person, but we know that's not always possible. Uh, Dr. Lum, uh, you uh, put up a list of cancers that were being looked at, I guess, for the point of the molecular therapies. What Are there a bunch of cancers that are not yet subject to uh, the possibility of molecular therapy? That's sort of question number one. And related question number two, um, you, you mentioned that we're in a transition from the morphology to the molecularly targeted therapies. Can you sort of maybe quantify where we are on that and when you think we will get to the point where the molecular therapy will be the standard of care for all uh, cancer treatment? Yes, thank you, uh, so that I can clarify this. Um, I put a list up there, and those are characteristic cancers that have characteristic mutations that are known targets for those particular drugs. Um, there are other cancers that are not classic in that list, and that falls under the ideas of how we're treating some of those cancers with comprehensive genomic profiling. That some cancers, based on their morphology, even though they're not on that list, by profiling them, if they find a particular alteration where there is a corresponding therapy, they can now be put into a trial like MATCH, like IMPACT, or like Star Trek, where um, they can receive that drug with, for that target, even though they're not classically represented in that list. Um, where are we in, in terms of that timeline? I think that it's very exciting, and there is anecdotal and case-based or single person um, reports of, of success happening where there is an unknown cancer that was not on that list. They had a target, and that target is treated with a molecular targeted therapy, and the, the cancer um, uh, shrinks. And, and those single um, uh, cases, you know, begin to mount and begin to increase in number, and that's what uh, makes clinicians and payers and the scientific community and the clinical community very excited about targeted therapies. Um, this is the idea of what they call N of 1, and the N of 1 idea is that in the past we had to have a certain sample size in, to, in order to show clinical significance, in order for us to create a guideline for that particular cancer therapy. 
But in the N of 1 situation, it's all of these single cases where um, it's an unknown cancer that has a particular mutation that responded to this therapy, and it's so unique because it's that perturb that's person's cancer. That's the idea of that personalized medicine. That one single case won't ever re reach the statistical significance to warrant a new guideline, but the number of cases as they begin growing uh, will probably show that the N of 1 idea will be able to treat cancer in that kind of targeted way. One other question, I guess, and that is that I think I read somewhere that now cancer is now beating uh, heart disease to the number one killer uh, situation. When can we expect all of this to result in an actual, you know, victory over cancer? <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully soon. And I mean, I guess the idea is that, you know, there's a lot of promise with, with molecular target therapies. I mean, there is this one case that I remember that was presented in the New England Journal of Medicine where there was a metastatic melanoma on the abdomen of a woman in New York. And it was this mass, it was ulcerating. And being treated with a targeted therapy, it, it shrank to the point where it created a hole in her stomach because the tumor had just melted away. Um, hopefully there'll be more stories like that. Um, but I think that in the future, it, monotherapy, molecular targeted therapy is not going to be the standard. It will probably be a combination um, targeted approach that is dictated by pathway analysis. That's sort of like the new trajectory now for um, targeted molecular therapies. Okay, we're running up against time. I see we have three questions. If the questions are short, we'll take all three. Otherwise, we're gonna start here and end there. Thank you. Is just still considered sarcoma? Yes. Um, in a family, mother has just daughter leomyosarcoma and a second maternal cousin's uh, soft tissue sarcoma. What is the risk for other family members? Or not? Um, is that is that on? Yeah, I think um, I I wouldn't have an exam I wouldn't have an answer specifically of what the risk would be for other family members, but what I could say is that those that's an example of where we're seeing some red flags of some clustering of multiple people um, with a particular type of cancer, and so there are some genes on the hereditary level that we know that can cause an increased risk of sarcoma. For example, there's a gene called TP53 or P53. And so that would be an example of one that we would be able to, um, you know, go through all of the family history and, um, you know, discuss all of the information involved in it if the patient's interested to do the genetic testing for that gene and possibly others. Thank you. So if I <clears throat> had a family, strong family history of breast cancer, two sisters, 50 and under, mother, both sides, that kind of strong family history, but I don't have any, thankfully, myself. I know you can do a lot of preventive and stuff, but um, there, I also have a daughter, and, you know, with political things the way they are, if, if I tested, say, I, this, I ha say I had it, um, would she be at risk of not getting health insurance? You know, what, what would you, your recommendation be? Because it's a dilemma, right? Whether, I mean, it could help, it helped me, and it's the knowledge is good, and yet you worry that maybe your kids may not be able to get health insurance someday because, I mean, you never can tell with a change of health care. Um, that's a very good question and actually comes up a lot. Um, fortunately, we do have a federal law called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which is separate um, from the Affordable Care Act, so a separate law passed in 2008 that protects somebody so that their health insurance and their employer cannot use the genetic test result against them. So where a genetic test result doesn't count as say like a pre-existing condition, they can't prevent you from getting the health insurance, raise your rates, things like that. But the law doesn't protect against um, discrimination from life insurance, disability, long-term care, those types of policies. So some people actually do think about um, that impact and getting policies in place 
um, before they would do any genetic testing. So that is something that a lot of people think about. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take one final question and then we're going to let everyone go because we're over time. Um, Would you please give us a general idea of the cost of genetic testing? Just give a few examples of common genetic testing and their costs. I can address the germline testing first, so the type of testing that we do of our core genetic material. Um, the, the total cost of the testing can range um, from the hundreds to the thousands, but the costs have come down tremendously in the last few years. And so we have the option now that kind of, I would say sort of the worst case scenario, if we have a patient that's needing to pay for the testing out of pocket, um, we can have it done now for under $500. Um, whereas just a few years ago, there was really no option less than $4,000. So um, most patients, though, if they meet criteria for testing and if they do have some level of coverage, many patients will actually have no out-of-pocket portion. Um, and patients of ours who have an out-of-pocket portion, it's often not more than about $100. But in terms of the, gen the germline gene testing, each individual patient that we meet with we go through all of that information and have it all verified um, before the testing is actually done so there's no surprise bills or anything. So that's from the hereditary genetic testing perspective. Thank you. Okay, round of applause for Allison, Christina, Dr. Lum, and Kristen. Thank you all for your patience this evening. Real quick, next month, Diagnosing Dementia, Wednesday, July 26th. 6 to 7 p.m. right here again. Remember to validate your parking tickets outside if you haven't done so already and turn in your validation forms on the tables. I think we're going to bring our panelists outside um, for those of them that may be able to stick around because I'm sure they all have family kuleana. Um, you guys can feel free to talk story with them outside for those that can stay with us. Mahalo, have a good evening. <laughs>